Hey, welcome to the Charlie Paparelli Show. I'm Charlie Paparelli. I am a 30-year-plus angel investor, and this show is all about helping entrepreneurs start companies from scratch and to build them into really valuable assets that have impact in their communities. And to that end, I have a conversation. I usually invite somebody who's a great entrepreneur who's successful, and the, today it's Chris Klaus. And... Uh, and what we do is we give you the opportunity to hear his story and gives you then you can kind of pick and choose what makes sense for you to apply as you start your companies and you build them into valuable enterprises. This is a podcast that gets published every single Friday. And uh, you could also view it on my YouTube channel if you would rather see the video of it. The um, so I recommend that what you do so you don't miss an episode is subscribe at paparelli.com, which is at the bottom of the screen. All you have to do is submit your email and you are a part of it. So my guest today is Chris Klaus. Chris is the founder of Internet Security Systems, and I think he did it while he was a freshman at Georgia Tech. He, I kind of look at Chris as sort of really the founder of Internet Security. It was incredible how early on he picked this up. That company, Internet Security System, was sold eventually to IBM for $1.3 billion. He is also the founder of Kineva, a virtual world and game company based in Atlanta. He is the co-founder of NeuroLaunch, which is the world's first accelerator program for early stage startups related to neuroscience, and the co-founder of CyberLaunch, the world's leading accelerator for inter information security and machine learning startups. I always found Chris as a futuristic thinking thinker. He's a man of ideas. He's a man of action. He just doesn't sit on them. He does them. True entrepreneur. He is also a significant community contributor and developer. He loves entrepreneurs, and he especially loves the younger ones. He's a philanthropist and has a building with his name on it at Georgia Tech. All these accomplishments. And I would call Chris a humble man. He's just doing what he's called to do. So, Chris, welcome and thanks for joining me and sharing with this entrepreneur community of mine. I oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited man, to, I, was looking to forward, I was looking forward to this because you are involved in so many things. <laughs> all the time. That mind of yours is always active. So kind of why don't you bring us up, bring the audience up to date on kind of what you're involved in today? You know, sure. What's taking your time? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, in the last probably like four or five years, I started a uh, accelerator. You, you referenced two accelerators that I had started, one uh, or co-founded. One was Neural Launch. Uh, and the idea is 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 finding startups in the neuroscience space and helping provide resources and funding and mentorship, et cetera. And then we we did that and uh, scaled it to Cyber Launch that you referenced. And then also most recently, so Neuro Launch turned into Cyber Launch. Yeah, basically we we wanted. So there to, isn't two. There isn't two accelerators. Uh, I would say there's it was a, it was a, a big part of the same team doing both, um, and we ended up uh, doing those two. And then we also I kicked off taking what I knew with Cyber Launch and Neuro Launch, uh, worked with Georgia Tech to also kick off what is now called CreateX at Georgia Tech and CreateX. Um, okay. Yep, and that's what, that's what got you. What got you into all of this accelerator stuff? I mean, because I think what you did is you came out of uh, you start a ISS as an entrepreneur, you start Kineva as an entrepreneur, and then you're all of a sudden you're into this whole angel investor uh, entrepreneurs accelerators. You know what what started that movement into? Because that's a real big thing. That's moving from sort of creator, if you will, or operator to investor, right? Um, I, I would actually, I'll give you kind of my, the, the vision there. Cause I, I don't, I actually don't think of myself as an investor. Um, okay. you know, part of, part of what I'm doing is, you know, I have a vision of trying to help build kind of a, both a, a platform for enabling startups to, to succeed. Um, and part of that is getting great talent. So if one of, one of the things I did probably about 20 years ago was, 
working with Georgia Tech, um, gave a donation, built the uh, advanced computing building down at Georgia Tech um, to attract the world's best talent to to Georgia. And mm-hmm. then part of part of that long term 20 year vision has been not only to attract talent, but then create the seed of, you know, do they have ideas and, and really kind of foster, um, you know, the path of what what would have helped me succeed faster, quicker? Um, how do I get on that path, et cetera? And so I, I try to encapsulate all that. And I see accelerators as, as kind of the, as a program or a, a, a community that can help startups actually succeed. So my interest is not so much to just invest, which I think investment is part of the formula of, you know, what got ISS or internet security systems off the ground was, I had uh, John Imlay and Sig Mosley and lots of other investors um, helping me. Um, but quite frankly, the real value is was probably the uh, the mentorship, the the advice, the wisdom. Uh, you know, w- w- yeah, well, that makes sense. Did- but why would you? It's something for an entrepreneur to kind of move to this this vision that you have is a vision for others. It's not a vision for you if you will. You follow me? As an entrepreneur, a lot of entrepreneurs, they say, oh, I built this company. Now I'm building this company. And now I'm on to building this company. You look at a guy like Jack Dorsey, right? CEO of two different companies, all that kind of stuff. He always stayed as sort of an operator and a leader in the company. You've kind of moved into, it's been interesting, this this turn that you've taken and this vision you articulate, which is really more community-based. It's almost to help the state of Georgia through Georgia Tech to continue to attract talent and then to build it, educate them, and then to start companies around them, right? Give them an opportunity. That's a bigger vision than most entrepreneurs actually have. So where did that kind of come from? Uh, I guess I guess I, I've uh, always looked back and go, well, what, what, what helped me succeed? And so – you know, if I look at like the things that were game changers for me, one was I learned how to code. So one of the things I've been, I did with um, Governor Purdue and with the help of Governor Kemp and probably the last three governors working with them, all, all of them to try to get coding uh, into K-12, which is, you know, learning computer languages at an earlier age. It's something that I was fortunate that I just gravitated towards yeah. playing games. And then I wanted to make my own game and that happened in middle school and high school. And, <laughs> and uh, I guess, and so with that, I was fortunate to work with the uh, the governor and basically saying, Hey, why are we requiring foreign language as the only language? Why not have computer language as a, as a, another language to learn. And so Georgia actually became one of the first states where you could graduate with knowing Java or a computer language um, and, and uh, as, a, as a substitute to foreign, foreign language. That's um, crazy. You know, I hear a lot about that coming out of New York through a VC that I know up there, but I never heard, I never hear about this here in Georgia. Um, it's, it's, it's not a big publicized deal. well. Yeah, it's it's not um maybe if your kids are going and it's still it's still I guess learn they're still trying to scale it, right? I mean there's you know thousands of high schools and you know getting the resources out there, but it's definitely taking a much bigger um path. I still think there's a huge opportunity to continue to grow there. So that's that's an area that um working with Georgia Tech and working with the governor and working with others to try to have computer languages down into the K-12 level, I believe is critical for kids growing up just so that if they come out of high school, if they know how to code, you know, they're, even if they don't want to be a programmer, just knowing how to program yeah. uh, puts them way ahead because you can learn all kinds of other aspects of almost every industry, every business that has some level of computers and you know, wanting to build a website or an app or who, you know, whatever they want to wow. build. And if you want to be a startup, you know, most, almost the majority of the startups that I'm, I work with, I would say the founders or one of the founders is a technical co-founder and, and needs to know how to build stuff. Um, ultimately that, that makes it a whole lot easier if you can build the product and not just 
talk about it. Yeah, one of the biggest issues that I see is uh, in this sort of next generation of founders, you find in people that have good business and industry background, but mm. what they lack is they lack the computer skills. So they have real insights into what the problem is that needs to be solved and where the opportunity is here and have a vision for it. And then they can't seem to find anybody to partner with them that could actually build what they see. And then on the other side, but in the past, it used to be that people usually had either both skills or at least the programming skills, okay, and they created something and then joined up with a, like you did, with a business guy, you know? Right. Now, it's and- changing now. I'm seeing more and more of these guys. They're business people and they can't seem to land a good co-founder that's the the guy that can actually build the car you know? yeah it's, so, so i'm i'm focused on the other side which is can we find young young talent that actually knows how to build the car and then <laughs> let's go team them up with uh business people and get you know talk to customers and do customer discovery and the the advantage there is if if you got the founder is technical they can go build the solution and that's that's probably not, you know in the early days that's that's like ninety nine percent of the problem is can you build it if you can't build it there's there's not a lot yeah, of but this um, is but this is the other thing that get me is and this is where we were different yeah. my experience is I said you know I really want to invest in guys that and in gals that have fifteen years of industry experience I mean they know the market they have all these this network and everything else and. Uh, the people that I saw coming out of college, all they wanted to do was either buy de- build delivery type systems, right? Because they, they were having trouble getting pizza on time to their dorms, or they wanted to build social networks because that's something that they 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 had firsthand experience with. How do these guys that are starting this from scratch? I mean, they're so young to the game, come up with a business problem to solve or some sort of um some sort of a problem to solve that's bigger than, you know, those social networks, their college life, if you will. That's where I, that's where I get lost. Yeah. It's a, it, you know, and I, I'm probably biased because I'm looking at, you know, my own life, right. In terms of. I think it's great. Know, that's why I want to know this. I think I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. I'm right. I'm just saying this is my experience. Okay. No, no, no. And, I've, <laughs> and I'm just, my focus has been more like, Hey, how do I find people that are, um, you know, have an idea can build it and get, and then give them some runway of how do you go actually go from idea to, and, and what I found at Georgia tech, for example, I, you know, obviously I have the Klaus building down there and I spent a lot of time talking to students and I was like, you know, and they always had great ideas, whether it's a social network or maybe mm-hmm. it's a cybersecurity program or whatever. And I was like, why aren't you doing a startup? And the number one blocker um, was culture. Like Georgia tech really at the time didn't have any, um, you know, path towards startups. And so the, the students didn't even think about startups or like, I've never even thought about it. And then, so then Seriously? I'm Seriously, how long ago yeah. was this? Eh, six years ago, five, six years ago. With and then, all this Facebook stuff and everything going on and this lionizing Zuckerberg and, and uh, Steve Jobs and all that, they, they didn't even think about startups? No, and you could probably go back and look at how many, on an annual basis, how many startups were coming out of Georgia Tech. You know, if you if you look out five six years ago, you know it'd be a handful at most. And um, with that, the by creating a CreateX program where now that program advertises to the students, going, "Hey, what are you doing this summer? Do you want to work on a startup?" Now we're planting that seed, okay. and it. And it really changes. It's it's actually the same question that I got asked while I was at Georgia Tech. I actually had wrote, wrote this software to help secure networks. Uh, and somebody called me up and said, hey, have you thought about commercializing it? And that one question I, I can go back to and say that was the inflection point where I went from doing this as a hobby to going, hey, maybe there's maybe there's a business here. And so that shifted my entire uh, reality. Why did, that, why did that, why did that interest you? 
I'm sure so there's a number of students that get told that. You know, I know this is true of the some of the PhD researchers. Why don't you? Re- why don't you? Why don't you? Could, might you think about commercializing that? And they're like, that's not what I do. You know, I do research. I look for grants. Okay, I write papers. You know, this is a. Uh, it's a change in culture. Yeah, I guess I, I looked at it. I was kind of. You know, once once I started going, huh? Maybe I should commercialize it. <laughs> I I knew how how vulnerable the internet was because when I ran the software, it tell me all the vulnerabilities, and I was like, <laughs> if I just if I charge a dollar per vulnerability, this is this could be a billion dollar company. Um, and so I <laughs> I decided to go commercialize it, and so um, and and so I I kind of have that same uh, mindset for helping you know students engineers, engineering students to basically go, Hey, you have a lot of ideas, you know, why aren't you doing a startup? And then, you know, the second biggest problem was time and, you know, like, Hey, I'm, I'm at Georgia tech. How do I find time to do a startup? And that's where we, we basically hacked the, uh, the co-op system or the internship system in that during the summer, most kids would co-op or intern for a large company. Right. And so we, we reached out to the co-op office and said, hey, would a student still be considered co-oping or interning if they did it for their own company? And they were they were open to, to supporting that. And that, that allowed students to then basically intern for their own startup. And that how long that ago helped. how long ago was that that you opened that door? Um uh, you know, six, six, seven years ago. Did people, when you first pr- proposed it to the co-op or internship o- office like that, were they as receptive as you just made it sound? Uh, you know what? I, I was fortunate that I had a, a co-founder at Georgia Tech who was a dean, uh, Robbie <laughs> Bellaconda, who was like, hey, I'll I'll ask those questions around. So oh, okay. So he ran interference for you based on yeah, his credibility. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he and I br- brainstormed it and, and that became kind of the starting point to uh, figure out how to navigate Georgia Tech, you know, and get support, but, you know, not only at the, uh, at the, I guess, local level, but all the way up to the provost and the president, because ultimately part of the vision was that this program was going to be, and is currently still supported across every discipline. And that was a key part of uh, housing it within the uh, College of Engineering so that it wasn't you know, one group, it was, it's open to all students, even the business school or any student at Georgia Tech can participate. So it's, it's wide open. And uh, you definitely see the ideas definitely correlate to the kind of engineering you're, you're working on. So, you know, if you look at, yeah, yeah, if you're working on mechanical engineering, you're going to have more hardware stuff. If you have biotech, it's going to be more health related and, Mm -hmm. Uh, medical related. If it's uh, computer science engineering or computer science uh, students, typically it's more software related. So, it, and and what we found is trying to get a blend of of um of um, we started off with allowing one founder teams, but we ended up requiring you have to at least two co founders to go through the program, just because you know as you know startups are not easy and. Right a lot of pressure and there's always an advantage to having, you know, two people is better than one just because there's divide and conquer and different skill sets. And if one decides to to quit, you still have one person still carrying the flag to, to try and build the, the you know, business. It's funny, you know, that, that actually, you know, I always, I, I, I teach in the Bible and all that. And when in the book of Ecclesiastes, that's where that comes from. It says mm. two two are better than one, and three are even better because a triple a triple related rope right is really strong. But it it does give the same example. If one falls down, you have someone to pick you up. So it's uh this goes back eons, okay? <laughs> that yeah. kind of thought. But uh, it's also true, you know, in the in the book on on founders that co founders are uh, are the most successful companies for sure. It's it's hard. It is really hard. Yeah, yeah. But what no, you, is sure. there one particular discipline though that seems to have more interest in startups than some like? Is there more in the College of Computing than you have uh, easier to find startups there? People that want to do startups there versus than in mechanical engineering or biosciences or electrical or you know, I mean, industrial. You got all these different disciplines at tech. 
Yeah. I, you know, it's, 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 I don't think there's one that's more or less. Um, obviously engineering as a whole is, is very strong. Uh, College of Computing is very strong in terms of startups. So I think yeah. I, I don't think there's I, I don't think there's a um, discipline because what's happened is, Charlie, is that we've actually integrated not only this this like launch program for doing startups, but it it's actually been embedded into the curriculum. So there's now basically on the on the teach side, the learning side of when I now go into these classes, there's actually classes around entrepreneurship that didn't exist, you know, seven years so ago. The assignment, so that, the assignment in the class would be the project would be to start a company. Well, or know what what is you know when you hear about minimal viable products or yeah. customer discovery or you know realize that it, there's a process there that it's not just a black box and you open it and outcomes a company it's now there's there's actually a there's a whole process behind it and i think that's makes makes it feel more tangible for students that they can they can tackle it and um there's a pathway towards success and uh ultimately you know having that as part of the curriculum i think is key because it 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 goes back to planting that seed you know if you've never thought about startups well, now here's a, a chapter on it, or here's a class on it that wasn't available to engineers before. Now it's it's oh, a lot of lot of the students take the CreateX class, and then the other the other piece that we've scaled within Georgia Tech is uh, in the area of research. You probably know Georgia Tech has a strong research yeah, um, over a billion dollars annually now. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a big big part of their, um, you know. Th- th- overall infrastructure. But one thing that we did that was unique for students is historically students would say, hey, I want to do research. And they'd find faculty working on an interesting problem. Mm -hmm. And then they join the faculty. Well, with CreateX, we actually have uh, uh, the inverse. We actually have the ideas that the students come up with the ideas and work on them. And then the faculty turns around and helps the students succeed with their startup idea. So it's it's actually inverting uh, the problem. It, not to say that all the research has switched to that way, but there's a whole group of students now that are now doing research based on what they want to research and not what, I got you. you know, it, it, and the idea is that they can then take that IP and turn it into a startup. What did you, when, so here you are helping these students sort of putting the, putting a little bit of a spotlight on this opportunity that they can actually start companies, okay, that they can have ideas that can maybe turn into something commercial. You know, what did you what did you learn that you thought would work isn't working and what you you weren't even sure was going to be a problem is all of a sudden turned into a big opportunity. But is there's been something that you said, "Oh, this should work really good this way." And then you went, "Oh my god, I just fell in a hole." <laughs> uh, you know, I I'd actually say, you know, my my uh one area that that was interesting is, you know, from a probably not my my guess was we would get a good number of startups. I guess I was surprised by how many startups even after the summer uh, continue. Meaning, hey, oh, you're interning okay. interning for your startup. Uh, you know, it's for the summer, and they can. There's no obligation. They're only funded for the summer, so there's no obligation to actually work on their startup beyond the summer. And once um, I but, got started, I didn't want to stop. But it, tur- it turns out, I'd say at least half of the startups continue um, beyond the summer. So that, I thought that was a real surprise. Yeah, I just I didn't I didn't have any assumption. I just was like, if you ask me, what would it be? I don't I don't know. I would probably have said ninety percent would have quit by the end of the summer, and right. you know, ten percent might go on. But it turns out fifty percent continue to work on their startup. And they may even work on their startup for like two or three years while students before they, you know, graduate and then say, I'm working on this now 100 percent. So we, we found I've found quite a few students that will end up, you know, delaying uh, for a year or so and then and then going 100 percent. Where do they go? So those students that continued on out of so they do they started in CreateX. They come out and they continue working on it. 
Where do they go next for help and for support and encouragement? Um, I mean, I think we, for money. We, okay. I mean, they got to eat. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends on if they're really, if they're, it comes down to traction. I would say like what I tell the students is, you know, if you're seeing a, an opportunity, ultimately you, it's their decision, right? But if, if they're seeing that the business opportunity is, is, is growing, i.e. they get customers, they get revenue while still in school, you know, that they should seriously consider taking a gap year and maybe focusing on the startup. And that's a decision that I had to make with internet security systems was, hey, I'm getting customers. I'm still a, I'm still a student at tech. Um, but I saw there's a dilemma. The more time I spent on my startup, the more, more, more my grades were going to take a nosedive. And so I was like, I'm either going to do one or the other. I'm not, you can't do both at the same time. So I ended up. So talk about that. I think it'd be interesting for people to see because how old were you when you, when you came up with the idea for, for ISS? Yeah. Well, the security system. I guess the. The, the product itself, I had started working on it in high school and then, um, um, you know, developing software, looking for vulnerabilities and telling and you what was the genesis of that. Um, just my my interest in security. I, I, I liked hacking and trying to figure out, you know, how did oh, okay. how did people break in the computers? And OK, I was fortunate that uh, I ended up finding uh, Department of Energy would let me use their network and uh they they as a high school student yeah so i got fortunate that i had a high in high school um there was some computers that department of energy had actually for specifically they had a program for high school students they took one student from every state and brought them out to lawrence livermore national labs oh i'm calvin san francisco yeah east bay yeah. So, yeah. I, so I was probably, I, I had an unfair advantage cause I was probably the only high schooler on the internet at the time and aware of the program. And so they were like, Hey, come on out. You'll get to work on supercomputers. But while I was out there, they were like, Hey, this, what you're building is, is pretty awesome. We'd love to have you scan our network and tell us what vulnerabilities we have. And, uh, in return, they became my test bed for writing the software. That way, you know, I, I had access to every supercomputer and Sun workstations and everything. So I was very fortunate. Yeah, those were the me. days when there was a high barrier to entry, you know, yeah. trying to start. Yeah. Not everybody had access to the network. And I was fortunate that the, uh, I had I'd met the uh, and, and stayed with a family that that ran the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, wow. And so, th- so they they were like, hey, you know, this, you know, but and I told him, I said, I, I really uh, am interested in the cybersecurity side. And they were telling me, you know, they had real issues, i.e. They, they had a lot of hackers breaking in and really didn't know how to secure their computers at the time. And so this it became a good symbiotic relationship they got they got the software usage uh uh with the reports and ultimately they quite frankly doe became department of energy became one of my first uh large customers on a on a per lab basis meaning we i sold the sandia oak ridge lawrence livermore so they each one became this is while you're in high school or when you finally went to college uh the free version that I was working with Lawrence Livermore, that was in high school. I went yeah. and then I came to Georgia tech and continued working on it for, as a hobby. And then it, they were actually going to pay me. This is an interesting, um, yeah, I was going to say, because this is a tough one because when you start programming like that and you see people start finding what you're building useful, yeah. how do you then go from, you know, just simply accolades and we love you and we'll stay at our house and we'll feed you. Right. <laughs> and we'll let you use our computers to you saying, you know, I'm going to charge you for this. That's like jumping a really high wall for a lot of people. How did you yeah. get there? How did you do that? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the interest, I'll, I'll tell you right before um, I charged them, they were going to pay me to work on the software. So, uh, Lawrence Livermore thought they were doing me a favor, which they would have been in in one sense that 
they were like, hey, you're at Georgia Tech. We'd love to have you come out as a summer intern. We'll pay you to work on your software. And I actually thought that was going to be a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, but their their budget got cut, which meant I didn't have a summer internship. But it it, it was a real blessing. Initially, I was like Isn't crying. Isn't that because- funny? If, they, if you would have went out there as a summer intern, you would have taken your $1,500 that you made over the summer and moved on. And this changed everything. So their budget well, gets cut. How did that change the direction, your direction well, at that point? Yeah. So the, the the bigger issue, just so that you know, the uh, if the if the implications are, if I had been paid to work on the software, <laughs> DOE DOE would have owned the IP, and <laughs> because I couldn't find anyone willing to pay me to work on my software, I I ended up owning the IP. So that's. That's a critical part of the success of any startup is you need to own the IP. Did and you I, know I, that at the time? No, that's why I said it was a blessing in disguise. Right. I, I mean, it's just, it, isn't it funny how it all sort of worked for you? Uh, I got, got very fortunate. Yeah. You know, very, luck, very lucky. And then, uh, and then I, you know, later on. Uh, so they didn't do the internship. You started working on it on your own. What happened? Tell me how that happened. So they canceled. They didn't have budget. They cancel the internship. What do you do? Yeah, so I, I ended up going back to um, Sarasota, where I grew up. That I, I'm a native Floridian from okay. Sarasota, and uh, there was a Laurel Data Systems. I don't know; it's a defense contractor. They uh-huh. they were just they were just getting on the internet um, at that time, at least a Sarasota plant. And uh, the division I worked in was the. Well, how'd you get that job? Um, my dad's an attorney and he's, he, he knew, he knew some people over there and they said, oh, okay. oh we're looking for an internship. Right. I thought I maybe, like, maybe right. the DOE sort of knew this, this uh, nah. contractor and said, oh, this kid, you, you should talk to this kid. But nah. no, if your dad gets you in there, what, yeah. so, it, so, so what are you a, doing was, at, what are you doing there? I was, I was in the division of the, uh, what, you know, the airplanes have a black box. Yeah. You know, when they crash, they have a black box. They so I was in there. So this is where they were. Laurel Data System actually made the black box. It turns out it's an orange box, which makes it probably <laughs> easier to find. But I was like, yeah, everybody's been calling it the wrong thing. It should be called. <laughs> but uh, I ended up, um, I ended up helping them set up their network. So I, I used, I used the uh, uh, their network. They wanted to get on the internet, so I was I was on there. But they before we do that, I just this is off the subject, okay? But I got to know what makes these black boxes so indestructible. I mean, they're they're they hit I, the ground at you know five hundred miles an hour and they still survive, you know, or they hit to the they go to the bottom of the ocean. How, why are they? How do they make them so indestructible? It just it's, good, it's not just because they paint them orange. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. I I know. I'm more on the software side. That's a hardware question. So um, <laughs> but, it's but good to know. That. See, I told people you you were humble, so you know your limits. Yeah, I do, I do know that in in the back of the Rel data systems, they had like these huge torches that, and they talked about how long they would try to blast the orange box with fire, and and uh, you know, depending on how long it lasted, was how how long it, I guess the the certification level. So. I see. Um, okay. But any, but well, go ahead. So they want to get on the internet. Let's get back to your story here. They want to get yeah, on the internet. No, they, and there they, you they, are. They, okay. Yeah. So they, they, they were instrumental. This is and, to put this into pers- perspective. This is 19. This is 93. 93. So this yeah. is before Netscape. Yeah. This was like a year before Netscape. So. Right. So Netscape, for those who don't know the history, put a front end on the on the internet so that normal people could sort of get to it, okay? Yeah. Until then, otherwise, it was just more uh, academic access to the internet, right? Yeah. Otherwise, Netscape was known as a browser. So There you were, go. Thank they were the first browser. And I think um, from there, the, you know, I, they just provided a uh, good summer job. They were the replacement for DOE. And then I came back to Georgia Tech – and then that's when I got asked that question. Do you want to, have you thought about commercializing it? Who asked and, it? Uh, a gentleman, his name escapes me. He, he, he had just reached out from the computer emergency response team. Um, and uh, he threw out the question, 
saying, hey, we're getting a lot of interest in what you've built. Have you ever thought selling it? And I, at the time, hadn't. So that's when I, that's when I announced the commercial version, probably about a month later, just sitting in there going, hey, maybe I can announce a, a you know, with new features and so on. And uh, what are you, 19 at the time? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So it, it fortunately, I, I kept getting deals done at Georgia Tech in my dorm room. And I had well, three Tell roommates. me, can you remember the first deal? Yeah. it Because that's always the hardest one for somebody like yourself. I'm 19 years old. I got a product people are interested. And they say, wow, this is interesting. How much is it? <laughs> exactly. So I, and I didn't really have pricing and it was a, an Italian research center. And I told them a thousand bucks because I didn't know how else to price it. <laughs> and uh, a few weeks later, I get a check for a thousand bucks in the mail. And that actually um, was instrumental because I had no money. So that paid for incorporating and getting a business license and well, how'd you know up. to do all that? We didn't have any cyber launches or neuro launches or any of that nonsense, you know? I mean, you were on yeah. your own. Yeah. I, you know what? It's a good, you know what? I talked to an attorney and I go, I want to get incorporated. How do I do that? And he's like, it's, it's 700 bucks to get incorporated. And then from there, he gave me the forms from the I don't know, IRS to fill out. So I fill out all these forms. And then he mails it. I'm like, I just paid you seven hundred dollars to do these these uh, incorporation forms that he spent probably ten minutes. And uh, from then on, I was like, man, I need to figure out how to make it easier for other founders to save some money. Oh, okay. Um, See, now, anyways, that's making, now there's the, these accelerators are starting to make sense to me now, and why you have an interest there, you. <laughs> yeah. Well, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's um so, you know. so that you spent your thousand dollars in one clip. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So and so what did when the guy said, so what are you gonna call this thing? You gotta have a name. Yeah, it's interesting you ask that because it that's something that's always hard to come up with. Um the the name of the product, I'd actually called it internet scanner or internet security scanner. Okay. And and um you know, I was kind of just brainstorming with a friend of mine and going, why don't I just call it Internet Security Systems? You know, I've already got the Internet Security Scanner. And for some reason, Internet Security Systems sounded like a security company. And that that became uh, became ISS. Um, so there was no um, big, you know, search for naming. It was kind of just a brainstorming. Of so you have, the product was called Internet Security Scanner. Correct. And the company became Internet Security Systems. Yeah. And you named it at 19 years old. Yeah. And the advantage, it turns out, was, you know, I, I wasn't very, like, in, in one aspect, I wasn't very creative in the sense, like, what do I call this thing? Well, it scans the network. I'll call it an Internet Scanner. And then the company name, I was like, well, I guess it's an Internet Security System. I'm trying to, in the vision there was it's going to be a computer system or a network Security yeah. system that would protect networks. And when did you? When did you? So you started getting interested in this uh, in security. Okay, was the internet around when you were in high school? Who got you on the internet in high school? Um, I had a, a friend who lived down the street who was going to USF University of South Florida, okay. and he had access to the internet. And I got it. My guess is there might have been. Five people in Sarasota that had access to the internet when I did, <laughs> and he he he, I don't even he was like he knew I was in the computers, he knew I was in the bulletin board services or BBSs, yeah. And he's like he's like you like com calling up computers with your computer. You know, here's here's access to the internet, and I was like, what the heck is this? And then that that's that's actually how I discovered uh, DOE and Lawrence Livermore and. When did you, you know, when did you realize the power the the potential I should say not the power but the potential of the internet? Because um, uh, then you just had there was only networked computers you know I mean right I mean and uh, yeah this there wasn't, was there wasn't this whole idea of an internet you know was uh, this public this public network connecting everything 
was such a big idea, it kind of blew business people's minds, right? I mean, I think that most academics saw it as a way for university students and others to sort of communicate with each other and researchers that way. They didn't see it as, they didn't see the commercial um, potential of it. When did you see that? I mean, I guess for me, it was more just, I evolved with it, with the uh, the fact that I in, came out with a commercial version. If you, in 90, in 19, I was probably on there in late eighties. And so it was all universities, government, military. There was actually zero commercial when I first got on. Right. Um, probably in 93, you started seeing commercial stuff starting to pop up, but it was, it was such a small um, component or part of the internet at that time. Um, okay. But, but I think, I think there was enough, there was stuff starting to emerge that I knew you could sell software. I mean, I knew like antivirus software was selling and I was like, eh, if people are willing to buy antivirus software, they're going to buy software, you know, that helps protect their computer. And so to me, it wasn't a big leap to go, Hey, here's some stuff, you know, here's software I'm developing. Should it be commercial? Um, once I thought, you know, thought about well, it. I was here's like, yeah. the big leap. So you go from getting a thousand bucks from, uh, from this Italian company. Yep. Okay. And what kind of company were they? Just a research center. They just, they, they, a research they barely, center. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think they spoke good English. I was just happy they knew how to, we, and we didn't have Google Translate. So, you know, I, I <laughs> we didn't have out, Google. <laughs> right. That's true too. And, uh, you know, I'm just, their English was good enough to ask for pricing and my, my Italian was good enough to put in one zero zero zero. So it, <laughs> it worked. Um, and then I, so then where do you go from there? Yeah. So one of the first big customers was DOE and uh, they, they reached out and it, it actually wasn't Lawrence Livermore. It was, I think Sandia national labs had reached out um, and it was an indirect way. It turned out to be, there's a company called Battelle. I don't know if you've ever heard of Battelle. Yeah. Um, they're out of, out Ohio. of Ohio. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they were like, Hey, we love your software. It helps, you know, scan a network. Could we use it? Um, because we're a, you know, a, a research, um, company that works with DOE. And I was like, Oh, I know DOE. Cause I, I spent the summer there and they were like, we want to use it as an audit tool to go in there, give them a report of how their computer network looks. And I, I, I really didn't comprehend initially what that meant. Cause I was like, I think I understand what you're saying, but please don't give away my software. So I was like, just use it as an audit tool, not as a software to del deliver. Um, but they went in and did the audit of Sandia. And then Sand it w the indirect thing that I didn't fully anticipate was then Sandia would call me up going, hey, we just got a report from Battelle that looks not so good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they used your software to to generate it. So we need to buy your software so we could fix the issues and and then run it and make sure the next time they come that the report looks better. And so um, when I when I chatted with them, the gentleman looking to buy it, you know, I, I, I had worked out pricing. So it was like fifty thousand dollars for their based on their network. They had a Wait large a network. second. You went from a thousand bucks to fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand is more money than you've ever seen in your entire life. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. And how did you come up with that? That's pretty uh, ballsy. <laughs> you know what? I, I kind of just ballparked the, you know, uh, how many networks, how many computers are on their network. So I came up with a, and you know, a low ball effort. Like I just, I didn't know how to price it. So I just said 50,000. And the guy on the other line basically said, oh, 50 grand. Well, you'd have to come out and present to my boss and get approval and budget and all that. He goes, he goes, I have authority for 30,000 to buy it um, over the phone and you don't have to do all that. So I took me about a, a second to turn around and update my pricing and go, Hey, my new pricing is 30,000. And, uh, right there. And then he's like, all right, we, it's a done deal. So we, I actually closed the deal over the phone. When he and, talked about things like budget and the boss and presentation, did you know you're 19, you don't know anything like that. Yeah. 
Did it's, you know what the hell he was talking about? It made. I mean, yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> I know what a budget in general. I knew what a budget was. And I knew what a boss was. So I was just like, all right. But I, I also knew that thirty grand is better to get now than. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> They can go out and and who knows? You never know. It's, it's, I I got lucky because I probably could have gotten more money, but at that stage I was no. I, was I think you made the exact right decision. Take take it, and I I uh, and then what's funny is so what did you send the guy? I mean, how did you like? How do you complete the transaction? Because he's like, "Are well, you going to invoice me? How are you going to deliver the software? Are you going to train us on this? Can you? I mean, what do you?" I mean, you're sitting in a dorm room where you're sitting at grandma's extra room at her house in Atlanta, you yeah. know. Now, it is funny. You, you did hit on one thing that <laughs> I, I think he passed me to their internal purchasing people. <laughs> and they're like, just send the invoice. And I, I'm like, so I'm talking to this lady going, um, I, I'm a little embarrassed. I don't know what an invoice, I don't know how, what can you walk me through what does what do I need to put on the invoice for you guys? Because I have no idea what an invoice is. And so <laughs> she she was very uh, kind and uh, patient walking me through how to write up. She a, must have been shocked. It pro, pro, for thirty grand. I, you know, I was yeah. I was like, all right, I, I've got time to write this up with you. So, so she, she walked you through how to create your first invoice. Yeah, yeah. So I at that point I saved the, that file and. Just updated it in the future for for lots of other customers, so that worked. Um, but it, and honestly, um, once Sandia bought, then it became probably I had five or six other other um, DOE sites that that became customers. So I was pretty excited about that. That that allowed me to uh, buy computers and get set up with my business. Did you, uh, so were all these deals, 30K, 50K deals, these next ones that kind of went down? Um, you know what? I kept it 30K. Yeah. Um, so I kept it simple because I knew the budget at that point. And I, and I think they, the people I was chatting with, they were all at the 30K level. So I never so they really all had that authority level. So you kept yeah, it, that, had, that makes sense. So you could close, were you closing these things very quickly? Yeah, there was no... You know, I didn't have to do anything. So what is this? So you, here you are, you know, in these labs that you're dealing with, these accelerators, and these poor, these poor kids that you're dealing with now. They're just they're twisting in the wind, going through customer discovery to see if they're <laughs> if anybody are you know, they really solving a problem that people really need solving, and you just have people showing up. Um, you know what it, uh, it, but it doesn't happen overnight. Like I obviously I, I developed. You make it sound like it happened overnight. Uh, the, well, realize that I started building the software, um, you know, years before, and uh, okay. So meaning I started in high school. So we're now talking a, a year and a half into into Georgia Tech, and so it it, it wasn't immediately overnight, but it, I did get fortunate that time. I I would say timing is key because. At that time, the internet was just starting to take off. You, you started to have lots of people getting on the internet. Not mm -hmm. all those people were good people. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, the DOEs and government agencies and so on, they all needed to protect their network. They didn't even know what a firewall was back then. So it was easy to sell. So you, were, you had this interest in cyber secure, in security. You get yep. introduced to the internet. The internet starts to take off. It starts to become meaningful. In other words, all of these, you know, you don't get the internship. You do keep the IP. It is your programs, right? It all, like the Battel situation for the audit, you know, how it opened up, you know, Sandy. It's, it's amazing how not only right place, right time, but there's sort of this sort of like almost this wind at your back that, it couldn't have been planned better than the way it all sort of happened. It definitely, um, you know. It's like it meant like, to happen. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like all the, it's sort of like all of the planets aligned for you. Yeah. I, that's why I say it's, it's a combination of, you know, being very lucky. I consider myself lucky in that regard. Timing wise, internet taking off, had a, you know, passion or interest in an area that, 
was a big problem is, is still a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, finding the right people, finding the right, you know, as you point out, it, the, the, there's not one factor, but it's a lot of factors that kind of, because I was moving in that direction, piece, things came together. I mean, that, yeah. that was, you But know. it's interesting. It's all those factors that make for success in a lot of cases are all outside of our control. They all yeah. just have to happen right. They have to sort of, it's like these gears just sort of show up and start working, you know? Yeah. Well, and yeah. The, I'd say the biggest thing, if, you know, since we're talking about it, would be the fact that the internet played a huge role, right? Meaning the fact that my first customer was in Italy, you know, some of my biggest customers in my first year were Department of Energy. That's not something you would like. In fact, it took years before I had a customer in Georgia, which is, <laughs> which is the, and it took even longer to get a customer called Georgia Tech to buy our software. And that, you know, it's just, so it, with the internet, I was able to have lots of customers around the world. Probably. You know, it's funny. There's uh, Jesus made a comment in one of the in, in one of the gospels. He says, "A prophet is not is not uh, respected in his own hometown." Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of sales guys that I know feel the same way. It's easier to get appointment with somebody in Nebraska than it is to get an appointment with a business that's next door to you. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And I, and the beauty of it now is like the, the access with the internet m makes it open for everybody. But back then I was probably one of the few businesses where if I had tried to do, and I actually chatted with a few business people, like you know, as, as you were chatting, you know, saying, Hey, here's people who have lots of experience. A lot of them didn't even know what the internet was. You know, a lot of them, even when they heard about the internet, they, that thing's not, not the real way to sell software. That's not the real business. And, you know, what I'm, I'm saying, like, we didn't I'm, back then people didn't see the potential of it. That's why I asked that question. You, and you weren't well, even there to see the potential of it. You were this 19 year old kid having this area of interest and this need came up and you just sold it to people. It's not that you had, saw the potential of it. It just sort of pulled you along. It, well, I grew up on the internet, you know, in terms of it, it was like, it's an obvious place when you're, you know, I'm, I'm building software that would scan the internet. I'm like, this would be a good place to sell. And uh, it was very interesting in that, um, you know, I'd say that as you in our your own backyard, most of the people that I chatted with were like, this is not the right way to sell software. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm doing quite well um, selling all over the world, including, you know, government agencies and so on. So, um, but it, ultimately I knew that I couldn't do it by myself. And when did you come to that conclusion? Um, you know, I, I, I'd hired, um, first of all, what'd you do with all the money that came in? Uh, I mean, you're 19 years old, all this $30,000 check starts showing up. I mean, I mean, computers were more expensive back then, but Come on, you know. I mean, yeah. what'd you do with the money? Um, I ended up getting an office. I ended okay. up, uh, you know, getting computers. I did hire an engineer to help me develop. Um, I did. I talked to my attorney. Uh, said, "Hey, I'm looking for business people that really understand what I, you know, or could help me with my business." Okay. If they had any recommendations, I did get in touch through my attorney. Um, with uh, Kevin O'Connor, who was a entrepreneur, lived here. He ended up starting a company called DoubleClick. I don't know if you oh, remember yeah, DoubleClick. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, as a mentor, he was invaluable in that he helped me. How old me. was he at the time when you met him? God, he was probably in his uh, early 30s at the oh, time. So he was an old guy compared to you. He had you yeah, by he, a decade. <laughs> yeah. He, he, and he'd been around the block. He had sold a, a company before. He did mm -hmm. some kind of 3270 emulators. And, <laughs> you know, I don't, but he, he, the good news is he knew um, sales and marketing. And he actually, he was the one who put me in touch with Tom Noonan. So Tom, oh, okay. you know, I was, I told him, I said, I, I really don't know the, the marketing sales side of business. Um, you know, how do I find somebody? And then that's 
Kevin introduced me to Tom and I got Tom to join as as president. How did you how did that first conversation go? Because Tom was as dumb as dirt on the internet too, probably. Um, I, you know what? He had done some research, uh, and before you, know, you talked to him, or after you talked to him, uh, probably. I think he was aware of the internet back then. Oh, and he was is, okay. Because yeah, he was. What is, was he with Dun and Bradstreet at the time? Yeah, he was with uh, Dun and Bradstreet software. software. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, he also realized in ninety. So. 94 is when uh, I got incorporated. 95 is when I talked to Tom. So Tom joined just as Netscape was starting to t- get, you know, make right. make a lot of noise. You know, we became um, believers when it went public at a billion dollar valuation with no revenue. We all were like, yeah. there's something here. <laughs> exactly. And so he exactly. saw that. He was seeing that. And then he knew security. He did some research going, hey, security could be big. And so, and I liked him. He, he, you know, good guy, um, very charismatic. How, how, how old was Tom at the time? It's a good question. He probably uh, early, early thirties as well. He was. Okay. Yeah. So, so was, again, so you're still the youngster in the group. I mean, so here you are as the founder at 20 and uh, were you 20 in, in 1995? Were you 20 years old? Yeah, I think, yeah. Basically. 20 years old. He's 32, say. Okay. And he has all this business experience and you don't have any at this point. And uh, did you, were you in, uh, intimidated at all through conversations with Tom or uh, were you worried about being treated fairly? I mean, this whole idea of equity and cap tables and raising money from VCs and all this. I mean, it's overwhelming. Yeah. You know, uh what you didn't know and what he knew, you know? Yeah. I think, I guess, um, Kevin helped me on the negotiations of bringing him on. So that, that helped. Oh, okay. A lot. Good. You know, I mean, and I understood stock. I mean, I'm like, hey, I, I know I have, you know, million shares. I got to divvy it up somehow. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Tom wanted to come on board and get some equity. And so that, that, you know, we ended up working with attorneys to get them equity and, and all that. So it worked out, you know, and I think, what was your your concern when, uh, you know, you were going to partner with him? Did you have any concerns? Yeah. I mean, well, you're, you are giving up um, part of your baby, but I, I ended up thinking about it and saying, do you, do you want to own a hundred percent of like a small pea or, you know, a slice of the big watermelon? And I was like, I'd rather have a bigger, a bigger, um, grow the pie. And, um, I knew in order to scale, it wasn't going to be me. And I knew Tom had the sales, the marketing, how to grow an org and, and, and be a leader. And so I, I'd say that, that I, I think Did you that trust was, him? so you must, the other part of this is when you're a technical founder like this, and you're bringing in somebody who's a business person who, Again, like you said, is 12, 13 years older than you with more, much more experience. What were your, con, you know, when did you get to the point where you said, well, I trust this guy. I'm going to do this. Because it is, it's a trust issue at that point. You have no idea. I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's like saying, okay, you're going to meet this guy. Kevin says you're going to meet this guy. He's a really good guy. And you're going to get married, you know, a few days after you meet him and you're going to be married for life. Right. I mean, right. that's that's what a partnership is. I and mean, you can, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess if it. Do you remember back some, you know, some thoughts that you had or, you know, when you're in your sort of quiet times? I, I, I mean, I guess the good news is we never he he's great on the sales and marketing side and helping grow the org. Um, and then. I, I enjoyed more of the technology. So we, we very rarely ever had friction. Um, you know, obviously we had lots of debates and, and so on, but never. But I'm I talking those say, very early stages. There isn't debates because you're just sort of meeting each other. Now, later on, as you, you had a vision for how this thing was going to grow and he had his vision and I'm sure that you kind of ran into some things. But, yeah. Uh, for, fortunately, he's, he was good at saying, Hey, you, you, you own this area and I, he focused on his area. So we, I guess the other thing is I was CEO for the first, all the way up until we went IPO. And really? 
Yeah. So you kept so the was, title as CEO. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to learn. And I think, uh, you know, so he was president, I was CEO and, you know, he, he, he had, uh, you know, like 20% equity. So ultimately if it didn't work out, I could have, I guess. You had could protection because them. you were the majority owner. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, it wasn't like if it, if it's a bad marriage, it's not like you had okay. to stay with somebody, but in the end, obviously it's a, still a huge commitment to have somebody and, Fortunately, um, that marriage worked uh, very well with with Tom. And but that's another we, one of those lucky things because yeah. if you had a misfire, think about that. You two years in, three years in, and you misfire. It wasn't like you were the only game in town. People started to join the bandwagon about security. I'm sure. You know, yeah, when they it, saw you were making money at it, that people other started people started writing software to make money at it. <laughs> yeah. And I would consider, you know, it, with having Tom on board, that was definitely another blessing because he he is charismatic and was was awesome at helping grow uh, and scale the company. Um, so it, it, I think our amazing. partner, you know, the first time you probably never you never heard this story. I know it because I never told it to you, but I would Tom showed up when he came to town to join you. I guess he did the deal with you already and he um uh, he came to TER, Technic Technology Executive Roundtable, okay? And I was the president of this little organization where sort of entrepreneurs and presidents got together and we were trying to learn from each other kind of a deal. And he showed up and I met him for the first time ever. And I said, so what do you do? And he told me, we're doing this internet security thing, you know? And again, Netflix and uh, Netscape had just kind of gone public. So now everybody's aware, including me, of what this might be. Not really understanding, but seeing there's a lot of money to be made. And you're right about charisma. I mean, I talked to him for f maybe five minutes. And I felt, he told me about you and what you guys were doing. And I, and I was right there. I said, man, I would love to get into this deal. And what it was is on his back because he was so humble, transparent, charming, charismatic. He wasn't selling me on anything. He was just saying, hey, this is kind of what we're doing, you know, and you're just drawn to him. So a real gift he had. It was pretty incredible. And uh, obviously I didn't get in the deal. Uh, Sig Mosley got in the deal and that's the way it went down, but that's fine. But you yeah. guys did well. But it was interesting. That was the first time that I met Tom and he had just yeah. come to town. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and you can tell it, it worked out because I still – keep in touch with Tom every week. And, uh, Do you? you know, yeah, he's, you know, he and I are both involved with Georgia tech and, uh, I see, you know, he's, he, unfortunately he's recently moved to Florida. So he's now, uh, to, along with everybody else seems to be moving to Florida. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> I just chatted with him. He's like, I've, I'm got, I'm now a Florida resident. So where did I'm, he I'm move to? to? Uh, you know, I mean, on the uh, Amelia Island area. So. Oh, in that area. Okay, good. Good for him. Good for him. But uh, so tell me this. So then how did it, so you were then CEO and you were CEO lacking business experience and relying on Tom as the president to kind of hire all the people that are necessary to build this company. So you were CEO and in fact, CTO, you had to continue in that role. Yep. Yep. So how did so that? It, how how long did it take to go from when Tom came on to where you relinquished the CEO role? I mean, when you went public? Yeah. So Tom came on in '95. Three years. We went public in '98. So we ended up um, going public, and I think at the time the board was like, "Hey, you know, the the street will want a a more seasoned CEO," right. um, and. You know, I was like, "That's that's fine." I I I enjoy talking to engineers a lot more to than investors, and so ultimately, we ended up kind of in a in a model where Tom took on more of a role of doing high level uh, with the company, kind of just here's the strategy on a business, go to market, et cetera. But ult Ultimately, um, he spent half his time probably going to all the investors and Wall Street, and that's not something that 
I really enjoy. And did you uh, ever feel? Did you did you ever feel like uh, you were ill during those three years? Did you ever feel ill-equipped? Like, man, I'm way over my head here. Or did you feel like intellectually you're just kind of keeping up with it, and and uh, uh, you were sort of part of uh, you were you were in the river and running down river just as hard as he was. You know, I definitely worked hard with him. Um, we were I, divine and conquer. I mean, I I probably split my time half the time um, meeting with customers. I felt as CTO, I had to tell them the vision, get feedback, yeah, and then build a roadmap, work with the product managers work with engineering, you know, constantly. I, I actually enjoyed more the the high level thinking of, of, you know, what are we building? What are we prioritizing? What's the next product that we're going to work on? It's pretty interesting because, you know, you, you could, I could make a case and say, because you were CEO, it's sort of like the Elon Musk kind of a deal. In other words, you're, you, uh, you become a culture based on the founder CEO and the culture that I would say based on you would be, you would be a product culture. Yet when I look at Tom, he would, he, if he was put in charge, it would just be a purely a sales and marketing culture. You see? Yeah. So it was an interesting combination making you CEO because that kept the focus on the product. Yeah. And we, you know, what's interesting is I'd say budget wise, we always split it 50, 50, meaning <laughs> Every time we raise money, I was like, half of that's going to engineering and the other half can go to sales and marketing. So, and then well, that's the big decision you made as CEO then. We, we, we compromised, you know, and so, uh, and, and it actually worked out well because half the money went towards building out sales and marketing programs from around the world. And, um, and then the other half was building kind of the cutting edge technology. So you were you. So you then relinquished in 1998. Is when you go public? You say, yeah, and that's when I switched to full time CTO. Right, and then what happened is you're now a public company, and you're now growing. And like you said, he's got to hit his numbers. He's talking to the street. He's setting expectations. He's working closer with the CFO. All that stuff's going on. Now you're yep. in a whole new stage as a public company. Then in what was it? Uh, at some point. He stayed with the company going, you, at some point you left. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we definitely went through a lot of ups and downs because even as a public company, when, you know, you hit 2000, you had the, the dot com bust. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that was painful for everybody, but it hit us just because we'd been growing, you know, nonstop since starting my, uh, my company at my grandmother's spare guest bedroom, you know, went from, <laughs> <laughs> Me, quickly, I added an office, got Tom, and then, you know, from then on, we were kept growing. And then, uh, you know, when the dot-com bust hit, obviously, it we had to correct our own um, our own burn. And so we ended up doing a, a, a riff, and we ended up, you know, going through probably the most painful experience of ISS's history, which is, you know, you had to go through and everybody was ranking – you know, who, who was great, who was, you know, who's at the bottom. And that's just nasty. It's nasty. Yeah. yeah. It, and it changed to me, it changed my perspective at that point because okay. it, it went from being like a ISS truly was like a family. I think, I think Tom uh, and I helped create a culture that was fun and family, you know, very family focused um, more that we just, we, you know, in many cases, we were very much like allowing people to get out on the edge and test out stuff. And you well, know. everything, like you said, the market was pulling you along. Yeah. And you were yep. right place, right time. And it was all you were. So you, everything you touched turned to gold until, right? The dot com bust, the market tanks, everybody goes down with it. You have year 2000, you know, was a bust, all this stuff. And so now you got to deal with, oh, now we're just a company. We're not, everything's not working anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, the one, the one positive I will say was we were actually um, profitable before 2001.com bust. And then, you know, for I think like a quarter, maybe two quarters, we weren't profitable. Yeah. Um, and then we became profitable right after that. So it, out of all the dot coms that were not generating any real revenue or any real profit, 
we were probably one of the few companies <clears throat> that was had a story of hey, we were one of we the few had, companies that was a real company, we're, we're making real revenue, real yeah, profit, right. you know, and. Um, so what happened? So that so you go through this now, like you said, fifty percent of the money is being spent on sales, fifty percent of the and marketing, fifty percent on uh, on technology, right? So yeah. now you got to do a riff. This is a this is that first experience for every manager that he has to do a riff, and it is the it's the worst experience anybody in leadership has to go through especially a first time because you just can't, because these are my people. I have yeah. relationships with these people. They trust me. Yeah. I love them. We are doing well together. We succeeded. We had this bump in a road. Now you're telling me we have to get, we're upside down and we're going to have to cut expenses. Well, that's people. So what did you go through personally? Um, you know, I think, I think the, I mean, that was the, the core thing is that it is, you know, people that you, you felt like it was a family culture that everybody knew each other. Um, you know, we, uh, to go through and then rank people it, I think everybody ended up, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of sad faces. We, we ended up going to a pub and afterwards, dr you know, drinking beer, just like, Hey, you know, we got through it, but we're, we're there to help support each other. Even if you weren't still with ISS, we, uh -huh. you know, we wanted you to, land and and the good the, the, the good news is within a month or two everybody i knew had found positions else you know it it felt like the death knell but it ended up being that everybody got back on their feet fairly quickly and um you know yeah, there but, was it, no, but it but it split the platoon right no, it, mean, it changed the it changed some of the culture i think from my at least from my point of view so that, how did it hey, change it for you well, uh, before it was, it was, it, it was a rocket ship, you know, with, with right. where everybody, uh, was, uh, ultimately it, it, it was a rocket ship that we all were in the same boat. And then it, it felt more like, okay, w there, this is a business, right? We had to do the, we had to do the riff and we wanted to be profitable and, you know. So how do it, you treat that when you go this and you say, well, now we're just, a business. We were this exciting startup and everything was great. Now we're just like a business, right? Yeah, what does that mean I, to you? I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, well, what did you do with that? Not what would you, what did you do? Uh, it just, it just felt different, but ultimately what you, do, what ends up happening is, you know, you, you still have an awesome team. You still have great right. people and you're, you're like, Hey, this is still a big opportunity. And so we continued to grow and scale. Um, but you didn't stay I, long after that. Uh, 2000, I left in 05. So like four years later. Okay. So what happened in those? So you do this riff four yeah. years later, what makes you, what makes you kind of move on? I mean, you're on the uh, way on the other side of what that was and the business is still continuing to grow. Yeah. Well, there was two pieces to it. One is, um, you know, the company had scaled to like a thousand employees and yeah. you know, when it's, when it's a hundred to 200, you, you can get to know everyone once you get past 200, it's, there's, there's a lot of faces that you don't know. And so that, that's a big difference. Right. And I think for me, the biggest thing was just the roadmap was feeling like, you know, Hey, we've laid out the roadmap. It's going to take three to six, 12 months to, to do the thing. So I, I just felt like, Hey, this is, we've, we conquered a big chunk of what we wanted to. And so I wanted to get back into a startup. Um, and then that's where I started to work on the virtual world. And ultimately, where did uh, all that come from? Well, let me do this. What was the exit like? You know, I mean, you might not know, like you said, at 200 employees, I knew everybody and everybody knew everybody at a thousand employees. You might not have known everybody, but everybody knew you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> or knew of me, at least. Yeah, right. So how do you exit something as the founder? Tell me about that that exit in 2005. So that's 11 yeah. years later after you sold the Italians. Yeah, no, it's true. The, yeah. um, I, you know what? I think uh, part of the challenge was, you know, um, being a public company, great some – some uh, challenges. And I think uh, within that, 
we had IBM reach out, said, hey, we would like to be a strategic partner, which is code word for we'd like to uh, buy you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and and we ended up hiring some bankers. Um, and I, I, I think part of the issue or part of the um, timing of it was I was working on virtual world and I was talking to Tom Noonan and, you know, others and we were like, look, if, 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 you know, basically if you double our stock, you know, it was a, it was a pretty health, healthy price that we put in front of IBM. Yeah. Um, you know, and they ended up taking it. So we, we ended up, um, feeling like talking to IBM that they, they did, they actually had zero overlap with what we had built, meaning they had that? no, they had no products that looked like ours. And so, you know, I felt good about um, both on the on the sales and marketing and, and the engineering side that this would fit within IBM um, because there was no overlap. If there had been overlap, I'd be concerned about, you know, they'd, they'd do a reduction. But in this case, um, it, was, it was actually really interesting in that IBM is really uh, at that time was too – kind of siloed orgs put together, right? You had a product side and you had services side. I don't, right. I don't know how much you know about IBM, but- I know a lot it, about IBM. We built our first company on IBM back in the late 70s. Okay. Yeah. So I followed them all along with that. And uh, it was the late 80s when they started getting into the whole services side. Yeah. So the interesting thing is the services side is the group that actually acquired ISS. Really? Um, yeah. Huh. And- the, the main reason is we actually had developed managed security services, which was one of the first SaaS models out there, but for security, where we could monitor firewalls and burglar alarm systems and do all that remotely. And it was I a, didn't it was know a, that. That's cool. Yeah. So we had, we'd actually, I kind of, I actually think we probably undersold, you know, in hindsight, knowing where. The internet is today. That, <laughs> that, that, that that was a business that could have easily kept scaling, um, and but IBM saw the value of it and they said, "Hey, we'd like to acquire." So when they did really, you get off the train? What's that? When did you exit exit ISS? Uh, the day it got acquired by IBM. So you said correct. So we yeah. we yeah, signed the documents and I was out. Yeah, par partly because I was like, "Look, I'm already." Um, got my foot in a startup and that was part of the negotiations is well, like, tell me this now get me off ISS and then take me into, I'm very fascinated about moving into this virtual world stuff that you started with Keneva. Okay. Sure. So when did you get interested in this virtual world? Cause there was no one talking about it back then. And here we are now, what, 18 years? No, it was 2006. So uh, 16 years, 2000, yeah, 16 years later, Facebook renames themselves Meta and is going to bet the farm on virtual world, right? Yeah. 16 years prior, in 2006, you were already into it. Yeah. What did you see? How did you get into that whole thing? You told me how you got interested in security. How did you get interested in virtual worlds? Uh, prior to security, I played video games, and that's that's what got me into coding. And you know, if you play any video games, many of the games are creating you know uh, different realities, whether it's a shooter that. game or a mystery game or, you know, there's... Yeah, they had the fantasy farm, games, they had all that. Yeah, yeah, or even farming, right? You got Farmville. I mean, <laughs> so these are all, in my mind, these are all just different worlds that um, make up activities that people like to, to get involved with. Uh -huh. So the vision is basically, can you make it where, you know, not just be a participant, but could you create the world? So part of the the main goal of Kineva was Kineva is Latin for canvas and building tools that would allow people to build the virtual world. And I think uh, timing wise, I was probably too early, um, you know, uh, because part of what has really opened the door for these virtual worlds is the blockchain and putting assets on the blockchain. That's, that's what's driving 
all the excitement. So recently. What was your before we get to that? That's really interesting, and I want to go down that road. But what was your vision for these virtual worlds when you were into it? Did you have a vision um, for it, or were you just yeah. doing like you do with the internet, getting drawn along and saying, "Let's see what tomorrow brings"? I, the vision, ultimately, I, and I still think it's no one's actually done it yet. I mean, there's still probably another five to ten years before that get, gets really figured out. Um, which is that I th I think there's an opportunity to to create worlds and ultimately um, let you define your own reality and and by creating a world you it's a simulation right and yep. so simulations ultimately could be for anything whether you're testing robots um, you know it has military applications it's got um, experiments um, that are for example, sales and marketing, you know, hey, right now with COVID, it's it's been tough to do sales calls, right? To meet people face to face. But in a virtual world, you could do the same thing. And you can also have AI, you know, or bots inside a virtual world that simulate people. If you play any of these games, they always have bots that run around and you shoot them or they're, they're shooting you, but they could do other things like Long term, they're going to have conversations just like humans. And I actually think over the next 5, 10 years, 20 years, the the distinction between reality and virtual reality is kind of becomes the same. I mean, ultimately, just like you and I are having this conversation, you're seeing the digital form of me on your computer screen. That's obviously you're not seeing the real me. Right. But but it feels real, right? Right. We're, it feels like we're having a real conversation. Ultimately, well, like in a real house, and I'm in a real house. When you yeah. talk about virtual worlds, this is it's an artificial digital. It's sort of it's it's like the Matrix, right? I mean, it's that kind of that movie, right? I mean, the idea with we're in we're in this sort of virtual reality. It's not real. It's not reality. Uh, it, but it is. It but is once real, I'm in real. it, it is reality. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's so weird. Yeah, I mean, you're. I think your brain is a pattern machine. So ultimately, if it's as real as re, you know the physical world, what's you know, and and what you see is like if you look at like flight simulators now. Um, if you're a pilot, you can go into a flight simulator, and it's so real that the hours that you do in training there are the same equivalent of actually flying a plane. So there is no difference. The closer you make the simulation, the closer it is that there is no distinction. Is that the is that the most advanced simulation that we have right now or virtual world? Uh, I, I mean, I, it's hard to say what, which ones are the most advanced, but it's that would be a good example where they've spent, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I Clearly, the Defense Department, uh, police training, et cetera, it's a lot cheaper to create a simulation of, you know, whether it's a plane or a uh, hostage situation. Those yeah. those scenarios, those are pretty advanced. I mean, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on these simulators. And so, they, so the first place is that, that, we're, that these, these advanced simulations are, as you say, or advanced virtual worlds – really is in training. It, it, yeah. And then also ultimately uh, the training. And then if you think about like drones, whether you like them or not, you know, they're, they're being used in the Middle East and, yeah. you know, that's kind of a, a semi virtual simulator. But if you, if you follow anything with the drone pilots, they actually get PTSD from, uh, from bombing How about families. That? How about that? Yeah. So it's so what you happened, know. but you you've taken it beyond this now, and you had this idea. I think you wasn't your product called Second Life. No, no, it, that, that's a different product. But I did have Kineva. It was just a virtual world platform where I had basically thirty thousand designers building all kinds of uh, items or three D assets and creating everything from futuristic sci fi worlds like Star Trek and Star Wars to you know, um, people building fantasy worlds to building, you know, modern day versions of the White House. So it was, it was pretty interesting to be able to travel around and see all these places. Um, the, the one 30,000 people. 
Well, those were the designers. 30,000 um, designers doing this for you. So this yeah. was something that caught on quickly. Were you making any money from this? Was there any way to commercialize uh, it? That would be the one area that I would have, if I could go back in time, I I would prioritize that higher. I, I was doing it, I was optimizing for creativity where I was, I was measuring like people building worlds and how many assets were being added and so on. I hadn't, I didn't really do a lot of optimizing for revenue. And that's, that would have been probably a very different outcome. How would you have done it? If you would have, uh, looking back, how would you have prioritized, what would that prioritization of revenue look like? What, how would that have turned into a strategy, you think? Uh, ultimately, if you're prioritizing revenue, you then look at all of the features that are, you brainstorm, you come up with tons of features and you go, well, which ones would drive more revenue? Um, okay. An example, like I never charged a subscription to the world, but that probably would have been a good ex experiment where, hey, here's Charlie's world, you know, yeah. kind of like, and and then, you know, it was, we gave it to you for free and therefore you, you never had to pay for it. But in hindsight, if I probably said, hey, it's a virtual world, it's yours, you know, would you pay five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month? Yeah. And th those would be, those would, those would have been the experiments you would run to go, oh, looks like I should have been charging people for those worlds. How many people joined the world? Uh, well, I, I know I hit over a million users that came wow. in. Wow. But the, the one thing that I probably, and this is probably for other founders to know or other um, people working on startups, I actually thought it's a probably bad assumption, but I've, I've proven it time and time again, that uh, if I optimize for revenue, my retention actually goes up. I, I thought if you put, if you start putting um, paywalls and revenue milestones inside your product, I kind of felt like that would drop a lot of people off. But in reality, you can do it in a way that I actually believe or strong a lot of I've done a lot of experiments that indicate by adding in more um pay opportunities you get higher retention and not lower retention wow I'll that's you, antithetical right I mean you wouldn't you would never guess that and I, I even so like I've ran experiments where if you come into my product and I sell you a special that gives you more access to the product, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, and the question was, you know, how often do you show that ad? Do you show it every time they log in? Do you show them once a week? You know, how, how frequently do you do the specials? And most people would assume to not do it that frequently. You don't want to bombard somebody with lots of specials. Um, but when I did this, when I did the AB test and, and, uh, check to see if doing more ads versus less ads, not only did I get more revenue, retention went up. Can you explain? But the, yeah, I, ultimately I think um, people, if they're using the product for free anyways, for example, yeah, but there's an ad that says, hey, you want the VIP version of Charlie's World. Yeah. It doesn't bother you that you see an ad for one second and you click on it and you, it goes away, right? And so, but not having it there, you don't ever see it and that you never think to buy. But if you see it every time you log in, you might go, you know what? I use this every day. I like these features. I'll spend the 10 bucks. If you spend 10 bucks on a product, you're more likely to stick with it because you now have skin in the game. You put real money in there. You don't have to buy it. So it's, it wasn't a detriment to the people who didn't buy, but it was an enhancement to the people who did. So not only you, did I get higher revenue, but the retention goes up. And one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, that we need to build businesses for sustainability. Yep. Okay. In other words, you, you can't, I mean, you were a very wealthy man who was doing Kineva, so you could fund it. Okay. If And that if, probably was, that was probably the other, <laughs> the, uh, Inadvertently, I, I should have probably optimized for funding, self-funding through the business itself as opposed to me funding. That's my point. So when you have too much money, you sit in a situation saying, well, this is something I'm, I'm really, the creativity is what's, what's grabbed me. But what you realize is that if you didn't have the money, if you were Chris 
with, uh, you know, thinking $1,000 is still a lot of money, you would have had a different model for this virtual world than you had because you're sitting on a pile of cash. You know, you would have made it into something that would have actually made money because you have to make money to stay alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, that's ended interesting, up, but that was a yeah. learning. That's a, that's how we learn, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It definitely, um, where did it go? I, I put it on pause. I ended up saying, well, when? Hey, I mean, how many years did you, uh, did you invest in it? Uh, probably, uh, a good question. I probably worked on it for almost uh, 10 years, kept it, kept it going and just doing lots of experiments. And I think, I think the challenge is to your point, um, didn't really focus on the revenue that, that was probably the biggest, uh, you didn't, tweak that and I you never done. did. I never did. No. I, I mean, I had did some any revenue. revenue ever come out of it. Yeah, I was making some money, but not enough to to scale it. And it, and I think the other thing that came out is I think I have a better understanding of how to scale that kind of business now versus back then. That model didn't really exist. You know, if you look at most games, they they the, the gaming industry didn't have a good idea of how to scale that. And I actually think I actually think this will be more challenging for Meta than Zuckerberg knows. And the reason I say that is, you know, maybe he gets it right off the bat, you know, and and, and definitely he has a lot of people that will be thinking about monetizing it. But, you know, he's spending, I think he's committing like $10 billion a year to build what I was building. So, I mean, that's, it's not a, it's not a light uh, investment um, to do. Yeah, and I think trying. any. Anybody who's building this meta virtual world thing, they're all they're all putting in, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. So there's three or four companies that are going after it. All of the, every company that I know that's taking it, taking my the vision that I had, it's not a it's not for the faint of heart. So it's how many? So you got so Facebook is doing it now called Meta. Who else is in there putting this kind uh, of money? Create. I think Unreal which is a, a game engine. They just, they've raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and said, we're trying to build a metaverse. Um, okay. And I think. Who else? Uh, those would be the two biggest ones. I, I think would, you got, t- you got you a ton of people. You think, with, you think with Facebook, given that they have billions of users, how many, oh, they have a, they have, what, have, 2 billion users? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Well, the the interesting thing is they're actually, losing users every day um and they just had their biggest market correction i don't know if you saw that in the oh, news oh yeah yeah well they 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 said that we lost that we've lost because of apple's control over the iphone they've lost 10 billion in revenue so they went through their 2000 they've got to be going through their 2002 iss debacle here of prioritizing the employees and figuring out if they're going to do a riff, right? You would think. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I don't – yeah, it'll things, be an interesting – Yeah, when you hit the wall going when – you're, when you're that their size and running that fast and you hit the wall, I mean, there's, there's losses everywhere. You're burning through money at that point. You have to make some sort of a correction. And yeah. yet he's renamed the company – and rededicated it and dedicated it to a whole new vision. Yeah. You know? But if you if you talk to anybody in that space, it's a pretty um you know, look we should chat about this in a year from now to see how they're doing cuz ultimately, you know, th- that that vision is not something he's going to get done in a year. I think I think I think you're not going to see real results for another 5 years um for that vision to take off. It's, it's a, it's a huge undertaking. And I don't, I think there's a, it's a big question of whether he can pull it off. Um, What, what are the constraints that, that you see that, that, uh, that put, say, this is going to be a five year. And even after five years, you made a comment, you think it's going to be 10 or 20 years before these things actually start to show themselves as commercially viable. Okay. What are you seeing yeah. that I don't that I don't see or others might not see because you've been thinking about this so deeply for so long. Yeah, so there's there's a there's 
I think there's multiple vectors that create challenges. One is the hardware, right? You got to have the headset. That's one of his big bets. He spent several billion buying the hardware mm -hmm. headset. And that's, it's still not widely adopted, right? Think, I mean. It's expensive. <laughs> uh, it's expensive. And so, but the price will go down over time. So that's, yeah, that's right. another reason why in five years, it might be a totally different price. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the visual effects are still a little blurry relative to the real world. So your, right. the, the quality of your visual is not quite there. Um, there's also probably the higher level of do people want to be in the VR headset? And I, and I think that's, that's, I think if I had an analog, it would be 3d TV. Like remember when avatar came out, and you had 3D IMAX, and everybody's like, oh, my God, this is going to change movies forever. And then everybody got 3D <laughs> TVs that I don't, you know, just by buying a TV, you got the feature anyways, but nobody uses it, right? <laughs> nobody wants to wear goggles or a head, you know, glasses to watch right. 3D. It just wasn't – the return on the value is not worth the discomfort of having something on your, on your head. So it killed it, adoption. And so the question in that scenario, he's made a huge bet with Meta to say, is the headset something that, like, even right now, if I had a headset and you had a headset, is it better or is this okay? Is this good enough? I, I actually like, because, like, while you're chatting, I'll, I'm taking notes and stuff. Yeah. Versus if, if I had a headset, it becomes problem. I can't type because I can't see what I'm typing. I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't even drink a... A Red Bull. So I, <laughs> I'd be like, couldn't even, I'd start losing my ability to even talk. I'd be like, oh man, my, so now I got to take my headset off. And now, now it looks like I'm looking at the ceiling because my headset's on the table. Um, and you're confused going, why is Chris staring at the ceiling? <laughs> so there's, I, I think, so that's a, that's a huge issue in a, in a question, will we, ever want to go a hundred percent more virtual than what we have now, which is, a, you know, maybe. Well, can I enter a virtual world without headsets? That's my question. So that I, 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 I don't have the adoption issue of having to buy more hardware and all that. I just use my screen and I'm sitting in my dark room with my screen and I'm in my virtual world. Isn't, wouldn't that bypass the adoption issue? Um, and this is the big bet. Right. Is, you know, you got Meta Zuckerberg betting his entire company that they're going to be owning the hardware that sits on your head and they're not designing it to be dual headset slash dual PC. So you want to be in the virtual world. You're buying my headset. That's what they're betting on. That's the bet. Wow. So and we could be so we could actually see that Facebook could blow up and die based on a self-inflicted wound. Well, they, they, they've, uh, they've also got some other challenges um, that Zuckerberg pointed out. Number one, uh, TikTok is eating their lunch. I don't know if you're familiar with TikTok. Oh, yeah, I am, yeah. Um, but, you know, they said their number one competitor right now is TikTok. And I think, I think the challenge for him, you know, I, I don't want to make your podcast all about Meta, but it, it is interesting because maybe from a timely, you know, this past week highlighting. Well, I think you've got a lot of young engineers, okay? People yeah. like you're talking about at Georgia Tech and all that, they're all looking at this. They're looking at what's the next new, new thing, right? Where should I be? Where should my computing come? Where should my engine, where should my, I'm an electrical engineer. Should I be looking at headsets? You know, should I be, you know, I mean, all of these questions are coming up. These are because they want to get in at the beginning. They want to be Chris who gets into cybersecurity, you know, when no one knows what cybersecurity is. Yeah. So this is a good discussion. I think it's helpful for them because yeah. you've put 10 years into this of your own money. So yeah, you're not yeah. guessing at it. You've done it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, th so I, th I do think it'll be interesting to see how um, meta architects their, their metaverse um because that that'll be where it either is successful or not and i'm not sure he knows how to build it so 
that's I guess TBD. Um, and that obviously you can, you know, there's a lot of ways to build stuff. And sometimes if you get the right formula put together, it takes off and becomes like YouTube. But if you recall, YouTube had a thousand other competitors, even Google, even prior to YouTube, they tried to build their own Google video and, you know, and and nobody could build what YouTube did. They got, they got the formula, right. And everybody else tried to copy it. And I, I'm not sure so far, if you look at Facebook, their innovation isn't coming from Zuck. Their innovation is coming from acquisition, right? They've had to buy WhatsApp. They've had to buy Instagram. They had to buy the headset, you know? So, you know, their pattern of success has been, you know, Zuck was smart to acquire those companies, but can, can he now innovate in this new meta space? And I, I think the, that's where that's, that's why I think this is going to be a huge bet. And I, that's I think interesting. It's, so the founder who had this original uh, vision for Facebook, okay, Zuck, okay, when you're a founder and you put yourself now, how how old is Facebook? Uh, that's a good question. I don't I don't know off. I don't know off ten years old or whatever it is, right? Like well, let's that. say yeah. ten years old. Okay, is now I'm ten years older. Okay, this is what happened to you at I, ISS. Do I have now a next new vision? for what's going to happen because I was had a vision and I was good at the first one. There's no guarantee. It's zero bases me for the second vision. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other, the other thing that's going to probably have a bigger impact sooner than later is that um, Facebook's core business model is being attacked in two ways. One is, as you pointed out, Apple, but I actually think the bigger attack is coming from TikTok. Um, you know, in terms of time and eyeballs, there's more people watching TikTok than they are watching Facebook and or if, Instagram if <laughs> or Instagram. And yeah. I actually think on the topic of innovation, Facebook tried to copy Snapchat and they did. They copied a thing called stories into Facebook and they copied it into Instagram. Right. Well, they're, they're now trying to copy TikTok into um, what they call Reels, right. which is their video platform on uh-huh. Facebook and on Instagram. But I, I, the challenge I think there is to because I've, I've watched TikTok and I, I, I look at Instagram and my own experience is that even if they copy it, it, it feels disjointed. It, to me, Instagram was a great photo sharing platform. And now they're trying to add video into it. It just, it's, and, and the problem is if you look at user experience, you know how important user experience is now. Um, I feel that just trying to insert TikTok as a feature into Instagram, I, I don't see, I just I think that this. might be the camel that breaks the, I the needle right. that breaks the camel. I back. think you're absolutely right. One of the things that I notice about, the, about bigger companies is we we do look to copy what's working right but the, yep. the problem with and and uh, the problem with that is if you have to introduce a new product as a startup as an entrepreneur you have to be 10x better than what's in the marketplace so it's obvious and attractive like tiktok that was obvious and attractive and it drew all those users in you see now, if I'm a big company, it's already out there. I can't get 10x better. So what am I relying on? I'm relying on my brand and the user base that I have that they're going to get off TikTok and they're going to come on to my, they're going to do my thing. Well, my thing isn't 10x better. Yeah. I'm already there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just, it's so it's, it's a loser strategy, but it makes a lot of sense when you're a big company. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> and I, the other thing I think is the DNA of a social network matters. Um, yeah. And if I think about Facebook, that's pretty much my friends and family. I don't I don't do too many other people, right? And then if Instagram, maybe I've got a few celebrities, but it's still mostly uh, friends. I would say on Instagram. Um, if I look at TikTok, my content is nobody I know personally. It's all 
right? <laughs> these creators making these short little videos. And so the DNA social network is extremely different of how it's formed and who you like and what you're watching than face. So I, to me, there's a, it's That's almost a big like dis- a that, Yeah, that is a big disconnect. Big disconnect. Yeah. yeah. And so do I want to log into Facebook? Facebook for me is seeing my friends and family. I don't, I don't know if I want to log in and then have this thing that's jumping at me, showing me these seven so then where does So then I understand that and I agree with you. Then where does metaverse fit in, in this friends and family sort of, uh, they, they've captured the friends and family market, social network. Okay. Yep. So where does metaverse fit into that if I've captured the friends and family market? Um, well, it, 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 it clearly generates a lot of money for them. So, he, you know, I, I think it's TBD, meaning I don't know how much Facebook's <laughs> social DNA, like, I'll, so a, a good example, like my kids, they play Xbox, right? I don't think, I don't, I think they build their friend network on Xbox from who they play with and which games they prefer. So it's it's more the it's the it's the virtual world experience first that then forms the social network. Versus Facebook started off going it's real friends, it's your real family and that's your social network, but that's not who I want to play games with. And wow. so I think so I think I actually think the a lot of people would say they have a strategic advantage, but I, I actually think there's some underlying disjointed issues that they they haven't really thought about yet or have been articulated. Wow. TBD, buddy. That's going to yeah, be yeah. interesting. Help me with this. So you now – so now you've kind of – just the, some final thoughts on Kiva, Kiniva rather, is you've kind of moved out of the virtual – Um the virtual worlds and into where did, where is Keneva now? What is. Um, so, so there's two pieces that I'm doing. I, I'd say my time's focused on, you know, if you want to call it a startup world, um, I'm building a platform, not too dissimilar, but instead of building virtual worlds, I'm building um, a platform to enable. I, so I, I'm really into creation. Like I, lo- I love creativity and creation. And so whether you're creating a virtual world or creating a startup, they're, they're kind of, I won't say the same problem, but similar in that they're tapping into, you know, having a vision, what problem are you solving? Yeah. And then what resources do you bring to bear, right? And it's a community effort. And that's, that's what I was building with Kineva. So Kineva itself was, wasn't just like, here's Charlie's world, but you, there was actually some, a lot of social structure around you know, you could invite groups of people to become, you know, co-builders with you and collaborate so that, you know, a world's ex- very time consuming to build, but you could end up with, you know, an army of people helping you build your world, right? And all of that DNA, I think, is important. I I think there's a lot of parallels to startups. You know, you building Charlie's startup, you can try it by yourself, but you're going to be more successful if you have a team of whether it's co-founders, mentors, investors, you know, everybody who's in, who's vested to see you succeed. Um, and so part of what I'm working on, and I haven't launched it yet, but one of the things I'm looking to release will be kind of given out is to take what I've been doing with Georgia Tech as kind of a pilot saying, hey, here's all these, here's the program. Take kids that never thought about startups, tell them, why don't you spend your summer, you know, what, what, if you could do a startup, what problem would you work on? Yeah. Can you, can you build a prototype, et cetera? Um, what I want to do is build a platform that's, that's in a similar vein where basically those students don't have to physically go to some place to do their startup, but it's all done virtually. And what that means is, you know, I want to have mentors like yourself and investors like yourself and others um, to be able to find all these different startups, uh, quickly see which ones you're interested in, because they're at all different stages. Everything from, you know, don't have a product and don't have revenue to, hey, I've got a, a, a prototype or I've got a, I've got customers. You know, there's a there's a whole series of ways you can kind of slice and dice. But it will be what a virtual is- world where we're meeting. 
yeah, ver- meet meet online and connect and provide the right resources and you know help them achieve their success. I mean, that's so the would, goal. So you would so then ultimately you would sell subscriptions to that, like being part of this part of this meta world, right? I mean, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. It ultimately. Um, so you didn't it, abandon what you did for those ten years. You're going to now focus it on something that sort of that you've actually run good test pilots on in the real world and kind of bring it into this virtual world. Am I saying that right? Well, it's but and it's also slightly different business model in that I'd say the virtual world was much more on the artistic 3D modeling side. Okay, you know, okay. hey, cr- create a room and create your home and create your office yeah. and all, versus. A startup obviously is not that, right? A startup is more about what's the problem that you're solving, who's the customers, uh, you know. But let's let's bring the right people together virtually to make you successful. And then I do think the business model is a little different in the sense, like yourself, you're an investor. Um, you know, I want to be aligned with the startups. So if I I want to put money into the startups, so not only do you get all this this platform to help you with your startup, yeah. But we also want to provide money. But the difference is, I'm not I'm not looking to be an angel investor. I'm looking to be kind of a a platform that bakes in the investment into the whole process, so that um you know we're not sitting off trying to do a one off thing where it's Chris Klaus the investor. It's more here's my platform. Here's what you get with it. Right, you get thousands of mentors, thousands of investors, and we then run programs through it where, you know, every month they can connect with the right people for the right purpose. Wow, that's a big undertaking. That's a big undertaking. Yeah, it's, I'm I'm. But I'm if you excited. pull it off, then you're not only doing this Create X at Georgia Tech, now you're doing something worldwide. Yeah, so I, I do want to continue to focus on students, but there's, there's, Great engineering students at other schools, and um, so the I, idea would be. I didn't part- hear you say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm open to helping. I'd, I'd like to help all all students. So ultimately, okay. Um, you know, I, I think the key thing is, you know, if if it's working at Georgia Tech though, and we figure and we've got mm-hmm. seven years of experience of what worked, what didn't work. I think a lot of that can be cookie cutted into enabling other schools to do the same thing. I, most other schools, you would think they'd have something like CreateX, but they actually don't. Most of them, they'll have an accelerator, but it's like for the graduates, the, the kids that have already graduated. And I'm like, there's there's some real um, opportunity to make this available to freshmen sophomores, juniors, the whole, you know, why wait? I always wondered, you know, I always wondered, you know, with what we've been through here with this pandemic is, you know, that we're all working from home now and everything else, right? Just is, is, uh, so we've, we've gotten, the culture has changed that we're comfortable being virtual. I would never, three years ago, this would have never happened for me. Okay. Ever. I mean, I was like, why are we doing this? Chris, why don't we just meet somewhere? Right. That's where I would have been, but I'm totally comfortable with this now. And so everybody is. We're moved in that direction. Is um, I was wondering, what is the next step for these accelerators that we're seeing pop up all over the place? Are they really necessary? Are they serving a purpose? Are there are they really best practices? You know, or just places to kind of pull together? Do they serve different types of things like students, graduates? You know, those that are coming that are in business looking to start. Sounds like you're creating this platform virtually that will be available that can serve multiple markets. Even people just yeah, sign up for it. Yeah, and ultimately, it's 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 really about the community. I mean, if you look at even in the virtual world, the, the key thing there is the community, it, and, uh-huh. and can you okay. foster it properly? Um, I believe, obviously, as you know, that there's a there's a need for an ecosystem for startups to succeed. Right. And, you know, and even, even though I was really early, I recognize, you know, I got in touch with Kevin through my attorney, Kevin then knew these people and Tom and et cetera. And Tom knew a whole network of other people that, you know, help accelerate the success. And I think with the internet now, 
it, it makes sense to do more of the community building online. And, uh, but know, is it still? It, but is it community building online? But it's still in the geographical same community. I th- I think it's going to become sliced however people want to slice it. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, th- you could have accelerators at specific schools, i.e., Georgia Tech, which is is very um, school focused. But realize, like, because of COVID. And what you just said, you know, hey, you're now more comfortable doing it online. Yeah. It's now opened it up that Georgia Tech students aren't all in Atlanta. We actually have teams in Florida, Michigan, I got all over the country. And I think that's only going to grow. And therefore, to your point, is it geographical? The only – I'll probably focus U.S. only initially. And the reason being is more from an IRS tax you know, accounting, uh, et cetera. But long term, I don't see why it doesn't go global, right? Short term, I want to get it up and running. Well, and I just I, can- I find that to some of these things, and the reason I bring this up on the on the on the local, okay, or geographical, is or around a school or you know particular school where we have affiliations, if you will, okay. I'm going back to where you said about community. Like I look at things like that are out there, like Angel List, and you know other things. And they're trying to build a community worldwide, but I show up there and I'm like, who are these people? I don't, I don't, I don't have any affiliation with any of them. What am I? Because I'm an investor, which is a horizontal sort of occupation in effect, you know? But if you said, hey, I'm bringing a platform together that's in around Georgia Tech, even if students are in different geographic areas, it's still Georgia Tech. I'm still affiliated with these people in some meaningful way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so angel list, I would say, um, in this similar to you, I'm an investor on angel list, right? I would say they don't focus on community. They have a lot of funds that I can syndicate with, or they yeah. have rolling funds, but it's, it's actually not easy. I think they changed their model to be, it's hard to find the founders. Like if you go on there, try to find, I don't, unless maybe I'm not finding the interface, but <laughs> I don't, to, to your point, there's no real community right. building on angel list. It's either what it's, what it's becoming in my mind is a very efficient way. If you're in a fund to do syndication and, you know, it, but all the, all the relationships are being built offline or off of that, not on, not in angel list. You know, you can try to connect with it, but there's a there's still a lot of uh, connections you have to do to get accepted into the community, and there's not a natural community ingrained in AngelList yeah, itself. I've got a, I, in other words, I have to look for the affiliation. I got to look for the common interest. I got to, and, and it takes work, and I shouldn't have to have that. Where in normal circumstances, I don't like. If in my air community, I don't have to look for that. I don't have to work for that. Right. I know to go to this meeting and that's where all the HR guys are. Okay. <laughs> right. And at least we start there. All right. If yeah. I walk in the HR meeting, I'm a, I'm a fish out of water. They, because I'm not an HR person. All right. <laughs> right. Well, so that's the issue I said. So it, there has to be this natural affili- affiliation is what I think to build community. There's got to be some start. Like, right. So Georgia Tech's a good one, right? Because yeah, usually it's an easy if you're, or, or any any school, it usually like, oh, you're a Georgia Tech alumni, I'm Georgia Tech alumni, you're doing a startup, I'll I'll take your call. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. So it's just but anyway, you're gonna get to that. I wanna we we've been on this for two hours. I do wanna end with something, which is because you've done something that's pretty unique. Uh, when I used to was take we're taking my kids, now they're all much older, but when I was taking them to see colleges. You know, one of the things that I would do is I would stop in front of a big building at one of these beautiful universities and it would have a name on it. And I would stop one of the students walking by and I say, who is that up there? Whose name is that? And they'd say, oh, I don't know. That's just the name of the building. You know, (laughs) you are the youngest guy that I know that actually has, I, I know, I'm sure there's others that actually contributed enough to a university that you do have the Christopher Klaus Computing Center. Is that what it's called? Advanced Computing Building, but yeah. Advanced Computing Building, okay. 
How did that all come about? I mean, how do you move from being a wealthy entrepreneur, did well, to philanthropy? You know, that's a that's another that's like another occupation. How did all that come about? It's a good question. I you know what I I think it goes back to wanting to uh, give back. Uh, okay. As we chatted about, you know, is there, um, <laughs> it it was a question of how do I give back? I knew education was a big part of how to give back, um, and you know, I, I looked also to what was the contributing factors to my own success. Obviously, Georgia Tech, you know, had built that community. I, Tom Noonan was an alumni. A lot of my executive team was all from Georgia Tech. Um, so, you know, I guess I was already predisposed to trying to figure out how to give back. And quite frankly, um, I think Tom was probably the first to actually, I think they reached out to Tom. There was so the, the Dean of College of Computing, Peter Freeman, um, reached well, out to him. him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He reached out to Tom just saying, hey, you know, we're going to be we want to build a new building and we'd like to get you guys involved. And, uh, you know, and, and so I think Tom gave me we, we sat down and Tom had a, uh, made sure I had a lot of martinis and then was like, hey, <laughs> what do you think about contributing, you know, multi millions of dollars to Georgia Tech and. I probably was uh, pretty happy at the point of uh, after a but few months. Sure, TV. right? Sure. Sure. What the, sure. What the heck? But uh, we, but, but I were I deep down wanted to do it anyway. So I, I, uh, I said, well, let's let's chat with Peter, and you know, they gave me kind of an overview of what what they wanted to do, and you know, I I, I wanted to be focused on um, a sustainable building, very uh, open kind of creating a community on campus that yeah. uh, is open to all the college students, uh, especially computer science. And I think it's, it really is a big part of the heart of Georgia Tech, that building. If you, if you go on campus, you can't miss it. Um, no, it's you beautiful it. where it's located and everything. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty compelling. And I think, um, you know, with that, it, it's, it's kind of the nervous system of, bringing all this different multi-disciplines together because computer science, I don't know if you know this, but computer science um, has now become the number one uh, college of engineering is the number one college in terms of size at Georgia tech. Okay. And even if you're not in college of computing, every engineer minors in computer science now. Oh, Wow. So it doesn't matter if you do mechanical or math or, you know, what all, all engineering pretty much requires some coding. So almost every student coming through now has some computer science curriculum. And so this, this building kind of the, was the center of that. And uh, I guess, again, just very fortunate that my own path was software, computer yeah. science, and, well, how did uh, it how did it wind up with your name on it now that you're telling me that Freeman he's he uh he reached out to Tom Noonan, you know, how did uh how did it wind up with your name and not his name or both your names? How did that all kind of come to be? Uh it it all comes down to the the check size. Oh, that's it. <laughs> so they they basically said, "Hey, it's it's um <laughs> And the good the good news is it's actually like a sixty million, almost seventy million dollar building. Yeah. Um, but the amount that I had to contribute was sixteen million, um, and uh, hmm. the rest of it was matched by the state and the the school and and so on. So is that but, the so is did did you uh, prior to do, making that commitment to them? Did you do any philanthropy anywhere else, or was that your first foray into? Uh, Giving money away. Um, it's a good question. I don't, you know what? I I did volunteer, and may have given some money away. I volunteered with um, um, Senator Nunn. I know you, yeah. Senator Sam Nunn. You probably know yeah. his his daughter ran um, Hands in Atlanta, and so I, I I volunteered my time. Which, as you know, if you're busy, that can be 
worth more than than money um, just because when you're real busy. But ultimately, um, you know, I, I contributed there. That was another area where I liked hands on Atlanta because it goes back to community. You're, you're giving time um, to others. And, you know, HOA now is part of points of light. But that that would be another area where I, I in fact, at our own company at ISS, we ended up doing at least annually several projects with hands on Atlanta where we either painted a school or we did. Yeah, I can um, see doing that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's another thing. See, what what is what what they're, they're, the issue that I'm trying to get to is people who are really good at making money. OK, yeah. don't really give a lot of thought to giving money away. OK, because that also takes that's there are people that are good at giving money away and it's generally not the people who made the money. OK, so you've got approach through Tom. OK, from like you said, Peter comes to Tom. Tom gets you uh, in a good mood. Next thing you know, you're giving writing a check for 16 million dollars. OK, now I'm sure as you look at your net worth and all that 16 million didn't really changed your life in any way. Okay. Giving it away. I mean, if you had 16 million more, it's not going to change what you do or what you buy or how you live or anything else. So how do you, how do you continue on to be a philanthropist or is it just a one-time event? Guy just caught you at the right time kind of deal, you know? No, um, it's a good question. It, it, and just to clarify, it wasn't a check. It was actually, um, if you do it right, you want to do it in stock. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I get you. I get you. There's, there's I know actually what you're a, right. Well, there's actually a huge uh, tax implication. If if you, no, I know what you're talking about. I'm understanding what you're saying. If you right. give if if you give your stock to Georgia Tech, then it's a it's a it's a nonprofit. Boom! You don't have to yeah. pay tax on it. But right. if I had sold it, then I pay tax and then have to give the money. So it's better to give stock. Right. Uh, second question, though, you know, do I? It was it a one-time thing. I I continually give, uh, you know, to different programs, um, whether it's at Georgia Tech or you know schools, et cetera. But part of part of what I want to do ultimately is I th I do have a foundation now, right? Okay. And and I set that up and long term. Part of my goal with building this platform for startups is, you know, to your point, it, it's actually hard to give money away in a meaningful way. Um, and to give any meaningful like, money away, and it's very hard. Meaningful money yeah. is hard to place because you can organizations can't take out or you ruin them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I, you know, so some of the areas um, I'm looking to, you know, whether it's donate or invest, you know, which is kind of the Two two sides of the same coin, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> is, which is how do you how do you have impact? Um, you know, for me, like one of the big areas is sustainability. Like, how do we move from uh, you know uh, where today we pollute the air with CO two, and you know, obviously, I think there's a lot of environmental damage. I don't. You probably may know this, but we're currently in the um, stage of the fastest number of extinct species occurring right now because okay. we're destroying all the um, environments for animals, right? So ultimately, that's we've been blessed to grow up in a planet that had a very healthy environment. I believe we will need to course correct sooner than later. And so part of my goal is to invest in, you know, green slash sustainable companies. So that that will be an that'll be a big theme for me moving forward, okay. and I continue I, I continue to invest in solar, you know, wind. Um, and I think that'll solar. happen is as we get older, and you'll get a little older, you start thinking, you know, I don't need to be the guy that dies with the most money, you know. I mean, we're seeing this with uh, with Warren Buffett and with um, Bill Gates and some of these other that, that whole billionaire push, you know, the give away half your net worth before you die kind of a thing, you know. That's right. Is you know, as you get older, you you do get to the point you say like, well, what am I going to do? Who's going to take all this? You know, 
it, I, I need to put it to work. You know, God's blessed me with this. You know, like you said, everything's sort of lined up. You know, what do I do with it? Where do I put it? You know, you can only invest so much. And as you invest, that's even more money because you'll be successful again. And then it just compounds the problem. So moving to philanthropy as a way of giving back is something I think that we're all faced with. And I think uh, you're going to make an even bigger impact as you go forward there. Yeah. So, so I'm, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. It'll be good. Well, this has been a delight and I've taken you much longer than I thought. I think we've been talking a little over almost 210. So thanks for this time. It's been fabulous. I think people are going to learn a lot, especially from that ISS experience that you went through. Incredible. Yeah. I appreciate that. And we'll have to, uh, do it again and see where where the virtual world uh, ends up in the next over the next year or two. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think if I were if I was Zuckerberg, I'd be calling you up and saying, "You need to can I buy you dinner?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the the other thing is, uh, hopefully, you know, later this year, I'll have my platform up that's helping build a community around startups. Love to have you and your your community that you've been fostering uh, yeah. participate and be a part of it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. That'll be fun. Well, I'm going to awesome. sign off here to our guests and then I'll say goodbye to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Take care. Hey, thanks to thanks for joining me and Chris. What a brilliant, brilliant man who's been given all kinds of gifts, as I told you. And uh, there's some great lessons in what he told us here on how to build companies and uh, how to start them and how to build them from scratch. And you'll notice he hasn't stopped doing it yet. Thanks for coming. Please join me at uh, paparelli.com. Give your email and you'll not miss an episode. Thank you very much. Take care.